of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> <laughs> this is the shadow. My hypnotic power had clouded your mind. <laughs> the shadow. Yes, the shadow. I'll be there in every empty room as inevitable as your guilty conscience. Because her name is Justice and her revenge for your mockery will be death. Agents of the Shadow Report. Welcome once again to the Shadow Cast, the only podcast on the internet exclusively devoted to the immortal exploits of the Dark Avenger of comics, films, pulps, and otherwise, the Shadow. This debut season of the Shadow Cast represents a prolonged exploration of prominent firsts in the Pulp Avengers' near 90-year history. As such, today's episode concerns the first proper comic book crossover between The Shadow and fellow radio sensation The Green Hornet in Dynamite Entertainment's 2014 miniseries The Shadow Green Hornet Dark Knights, written by Batman's filmic caretaker, going, I think, all the way back to the Burton era, Michael Uslan, with admittedly somewhat languid line work by former Philian artist on The Boys, ugh, Keith Burns, whose detailed renderings of World War One and two aircraft in his current comic book, Out of the Blue, positively decimate his somewhat subpar figure drawing in the pages of this comic right here. As the agents of the Shadow continue to wonder at the status of the Shadow comic license in the wake of Cy Spurrier's actively dreadful politically charged perversion of this character and his intent in late 2017, it's worth revisiting, I think, some of the many miniseries you may have missed in the intervening years. There were a lot of these spin-offs, and a lot of them just slipped under the radar, and one of the few I actually hadn't read was The Shadow Green Hornet Dark Knights, not only a historic return for famed Batman scribe Michael Uslan, but a period piece set both in World War I and World War II, which is kind of the problem here, to be honest, but we'll get there. There are things I like about this story and things I actively despise. I love, for instance, that Uslan respects the lore of the Shadow enough to introduce us not to Lamont Cranston, but to Kent Allard, with, might I add, all of his agents in tow for the most part. Harry Vincent, Margot Lane, of course, because she has to, Burbank, Clyde Burke, even poor Cliff Marsland, who's so often ignored in comic adaptations, gets a turn at the plate here. And I love that on every level. What I have a harder time with is some of the suspect moral principles at play here from a character who has ostensibly a completely binary moral worldview. <laughs> for instance, we open with Kent Allard as the Black Eagle, aviation hero and spy master of World War I, and his clandestine meeting with not Woodrow Wilson, but Edith Wilson, who many students of American history will recognize as effectively the first female president in U.S. history. The problem? <laughs> she was unelected. She served the office in secret while Woodrow Wilson convalesced from a debilitating stroke the complications of which would ultimately claim his life, and technically the both of them committed a high crime by not reporting such to the cabinet and the press and allowing Vice President Thomas Marshall to serve out the remainder of his term as he legally should have. Uh, patriot or not, it's something of a stretch to see the same shadow that has brought corrupt cops and public officials to justice for comparatively lesser offenses, some of which were slain in the process, simply shrugging off the first lady admitting to ruling the country by fiat without one citizen casting a ballot for her. Uh, instead, we get the following exchange wherein the shadow identifies Wilson's condition immediately. Edith responds, he had a stroke last October and literally declares, you wanted to meet the president? You're meeting her. And the shadow replies, your secret's safe with me. 
bear in mind here, the war's over by the time this happens. There's no patriotic reason for him not to expose what is essentially a treasonous <laughs> autocratic act. It's basically plot convenience. They want Allard to meet Edith Wilson, and we can't very well have him altering the course of human history, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense given what happens later. So, eh, secret's safe with me. Better lay in some rebar to prop that exchange up there, Michael Uslan. Not exactly off to a roaring start here. And really, this story's primary malady is the same one I recognize in most period shadow stories. In short, modern shadow writers seem infinitely more interested in historical fiction, where Allard encounters literally every pertinent world leader and cultural figure of the 40s, than actually crafting a shadow mystery in the mold of Walter B. Gibson. Case in point. In this story, <laughs> the shadow meets or alludes to FDR, Adolf Hitler, Woodrow and Edith Wilson, Hideki Tojo, Howard Hughes, J. Edgar Hoover, The Fifth Column, and Nikola Tesla, and that's before we close the first two issues. The Shadow Strikes, which is an excellent ongoing comic series that we'll talk about a little later, had a similar problem early on, but after Gerard Jones got over his alternate history boner and started actually writing shadow stories, the comic became exceptional. This being a one-off miniseries, we kind of never quite get over that malady. I have to say, I like the pairing of Green Hornet and the shadow because the primary paradigm here becomes one of law versus justice, kind of a Superman, Batman by play a little bit. Only a lot better, I think. I think the purest distillation of this distinction can be found in a totally different crossover comic from Dynamite, the fully painted, utterly gorgeous Alex Ross pulp crossover comic called Masks, where Margot Lane, Lamont Cranston, and the Green Hornet's alter ego, Britt Reed, sit down for dinner and discuss the difference between law and justice, a scene which I will now quote as I have it in front of me. Cranston says, there is law, Mr. Reed, and then there is justice, which prompts Margot to groan, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Reed responds, I've always believed that they were one and the same, more or less. It's getting people to obey the law. That's the problem. No, says Cranston, they are not the same. The law is made by men, and like them, it can be corrupted. Justice is absolute and eternal. <laughs> you know, kind of calls into question the Edith Wilson exchange from earlier, don't it? This is clearly a guy who's going to haul in any old asshole, government official or otherwise, who violates his empirical definition of justice, which I'd have to believe extends to upending the entire electoral system. But, you know, I digress. The Shadow Green Hornet sports a similar exchange, though nowhere near as well written. This time it's on the nature of executing your enemies. After the Shadow, in the guise of Lamont Cranston, asks the Hornet to help him and alludes to ending this criminal's life, Reed inquires, what exactly do you mean when you say take him down? I should be clear, I don't kill. I don't believe in killing. To which Cranston replies, you're a pacifist? No, he says, I'm not a pacifist, nor am I a proponent of appeasement. But I've been taught by generations of my family that killing is a sin. To which the shadow responds, thou shall not kill, eh? A wonderful ideal for normal times in a civilized world. But open your eyes, Reed. Take a good hard look in what you see. We're no longer engaged in a war on crime. We are at war. Declared or not, it's still a war. People get killed in war. It's the ultimate horror, rising from hell to maim and destroy, to rob men of their faces, their minds, their humanity, their very souls. Do you understand me? Do you? I, I'm sorry, Cranston, Hornet says. Sorry for whatever happened to you. Whatever war and killing and torture have stolen from you. I'm going to start with the good because there's a lot of bad here. Many people have complained about this comic, and with good reason. But it's not all awful. There's a great moment where the Shadow's driver, uh, Shrevey, is reading Batman's first appearance in Detective Comics. And he says to Clyde Burke, hey, this comic stole the exact story of when the Shadow unraveled that mystery of those criminal partners at that chemical company, which is a reference, of course, to Bob Kane and Bill Finger plagiarizing 
the first Batman story from the Shadow Pulp Partners in Peril and even tracing artwork from it. That was a neat little bit of inside baseball. I also like that the Shadow is Kent Allard. I like some of the Great War setup. The Alex Ross covers are, as per usual, jaw-droppingly gorgeous, if eh, a little generic in places. It starts off strong enough but then collapses into cringy modern superhero pathos, which I wouldn't wipe my ass with. The Shadow is a remote, calculating, cold figure. If Sherlock Holmes humped Dracula, this is not a man you want crying about his wartime trauma. And sadly, we've seen a lot of this from Dynamite, who've been the greatest offenders by far of not understanding the appeal of this ageless character. The comic offends further when Kent Allard reunites with his agent in the underworld and fellow World War I veteran Cliff Marsland. After he alights his gyrocopter and removes his mask, Marsland is stunned, and he asks, Good God, Kent, you don't even look like you. You're still alive in there somewhere? To which Kent Allard replies, No. Then later he says something like, Kent Allard died in a trench on Flanders Field, which, by the way, he was never at, according to the pulps. I am not Kent, not anymore. I am only the shadow <laughs> i was just waiting for lincoln park to start playing <laughs> need some black finger paint and a fishnet shirt there ken allard way way too much michael uslin sorry remember that walter b gibson quote about how to write a shadow story from the first episode of the shadow cast uh i'll quote it again here you must treat your character as a discovery rather than your own creation treat him not just seriously but profoundly. Picture him as real and beyond you in mind as well as prowess. Feel that however much you have learned about him, you can never uncover all. This is the key to the immortal appeal of the shadow. We don't want to see the shadow sobbing about his service because we don't want to know everything about him. We can allude to it, we can even answer some questions, but the shadow is not Batman. It's just fine to have Bruce Wayne belly aching about his psychic scars. A bit boring, somewhat sedentary. Frankly, we're freaking sick of it at this point. But if you want to go emo with the Dark Knight, you can certainly do it on principle because at least the precedent is there. But can you miss the point any harder than having this remote figure of deepest darkness suddenly breaking down and discussing PTSD we've never been told he had? Keep in mind, Kent Allard was never in the trenches of the Somme. He was an aviation ace and a super spy. Or crying into his Margot Lane body pillow about how she died of old age in the Shadow Batman crossover that we'll sadly have to talk about at some point. As modern writers go, Michael Uslan gets it more than most, but he's still slinging all that modern baggage over his shoulder and plopping it onto the Shadow. The key to the Shadow is that he remains a vague, avenging spectral force of nature while his agents provide the human element and the human pathos. It's baffling because Uslan uses the agents here but doesn't avail himself of their primary narrative function, which is to provide an emotional center for the story. Utterly strange that he sauntered right by that basic point of writing a shadow story. I'd add the suggestion of Margot Lane being bisexual or lesbian or whatever in the second issue is painfully 2014. It's not thrown in your face by any means. Well, it kind of is later. But it's more than a bit silly in that it's incommensurate with the character to date. But of course, Shadow fans know Margot has been an ongoing issue in modern adaptations of the Shadow. Certain writers treat her like a glorified carry-on bag, others treat her like a hoe bag, and the worst of these treat her like Xena Warrior Princess co-starring the Shadow. The irony, of course, is that by treating the character as a projection of whatever social or political point or whatever entertainment medium you happen to be consuming that evening, these writers demonstrate an implicit disdain and disrespect for Margot Lane, who is objectively one of the first true strong female characters of the pulp era. But hey, you know, irony, what's that? Let's have her scissor, the Green Hornet secretary. And even if it's done for diversity reasons or whatever, it's done really badly. The dialogue is less like PBS in the life and more like late night porno on Skinamax. Like, oh, Nori, I was always attracted to you at the all-girl boarding school. Like, ugh, what even is that? It's like he's trying to be representational 
if indeed that was the intent. But it's more like he's perving on Margot and Nori. Again, my issue isn't really social or political, but every time something like this happens, I just think, this poor, disrespected character. Every bad modern writer seems to think she's a bag of holding for whatever worldview they happen to subscribe to. I think even Gerard Jones in The Shadow Strikes wrote some racial subplot into her origin that was never there before. My point is, when is someone going to have the balls to write this woman as she actually is. And it's an issue with more than Margot, by the way. Shiwan Khan is also well out of character. In lieu of a tactical genius, as he was in The Pulps, he's a bumbling crime boss out for <laughs> blue coal-powered nukes and death rays. Shiwan Khan has, he's basically copied his silly movie origin from the 1994 Alec Baldwin film. Which means instead of a battle of wits or cunning or physical combat even, Goku and Vegeta have a Super Saiyan Girasol ring fight on top of the Chrysler building. Uh, the story's a bit of a weak one, despite the scale, to be honest. Shiwan Khan being used by, and in turn using, the Axis powers to let the American auto industry help Hitler rev up his war machine, while Shiwan Khan prepares to use... Blue coal as a super weapon. Yes, you heard that right. And yes, it is ridiculous in every appreciable way. As motivations go, it's not exactly Ernst Blofeld caliber. It also gets a bit silly when he hears about a particular auto mogul and American oil companies shipping resources to Germany ahead of the conflict. And the shadow says something like, in a declared war, Burbank, these would be considered acts of treason from this moment. The shadow will have zero tolerance for these greed mongers like Shiwan Khan. They too are my enemies, which is like, wait, didn't you just cover up literal treason from the president of the United States and his wife? <laughs> I mean, we could pick apart the historical inaccuracies all day. It's like the public education system wrote a graphic novel. There's one point at the uh, 1939 World's Fair, I think, where Franklin Delano Roosevelt is kidnapped, wheelchair and all, by Shiwan Khan. And FDR says, you know, we don't negotiate with the Axis, even though right around that same time, I believe he praised fascism as a wonder of urban planning. <laughs> Those letters have since been published and that he was deeply impressed by what Mussolini in particular was doing in Italy. Like, I get it. OK, this is a fantasy. FDR is like just this side of a superhero <laughs> to Michael Uslan, apparently. Shiwan Khan is powering a death ray with the shadows, Girasol ring. But still, it lapses into comedy if you've ever opened a history book in your life. Life. It's also an awkwardly written comic, I should add, in so much as it loves to describe things you can already see, which is a hallmark of any bad comic, really. For instance, spoiler alert, Shiwan Khan blows something up with his death ray, let's say. And the Green Hornet shouts, whoops, I'm too late. Shiwan Khan blew the thing up with his death ray. It's like it was written for radio and not at all in a good way. I mean, at one point, Kato karate chops an overgrown albino alligator that was flushed down the sewer by Florida tourists. I can't think of a more encapsulatory sentence for the shadow green hornet dark nights. Just wow. What a turd. And one that feels more like a movie treatment for a film version of the shadow that is stunningly far, far worse than what we actually received in 1994. Bit of a dodged bullet here. In Shadow-related news, Michael Uslan has recently declared his intent to pen another Shadow comic for Dynamite, and I really can't imagine it being anything I remotely want to read. No offense, Mr. Uslan. Uh, I respect you and your work. Just this is not my cup of tea. The Shadow Green Hornet is a hard pass. Well, as I said, fellow agents, this first season of the Shadowcast will be entitled Birth of a Dark Legend, devoted in exclusivity to the exploration and review of prominent firsts in the history of the Night of Darkness. Namely, this week, his first encounter with the Dark Knight in Batman number 253, I believe from 1973, a story called Who Knows What Evil Lurks. What I like about this particular crossover is that for all its faults, and it has a fair few, this comic predates 
the Dark Knight era of Batman. This is from around 73 when Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams were still sort of in the process of realigning the Caped Crusader back to the pulpy Avenger of the Night. We now know was entirely ripped off from not one but several early pulp adventures of the Shadow, meaning there's still some swashbuckling Adam Westiness on offer here. And so unlike the Dynamite crossovers, where we have two crime fighters trying to outshadow each other, and the writer, who so very often is playing favorites, decrees the copy is the victor. In this case, we actually have two distinct characters playing off of one another. Batman arcing toward his darker incarnation, but not quite there. And the Shadow in full two-fisted Pulp Avenger mode. You get some contrast, and you get the sense that these are actually two separate characters. Something slightly missing from the more recent crossovers. I think my favorite bit of, I don't know, coastal bias? Is when Bats follows a clue the Shadow laid out for him in his pulse-pounding investigation of fake money or some such. To, you guessed it, Arizona! Whereupon, in a city consisting of, like, a biplane and two tumbleweeds, the lone town person, who looks like Jeff Foxworthy took a hard vocational left turn into gay porn, by the way, immediately begins conversing like Yosemite Sam on Novocaine. I'll actually quote now. You'd be Bruce Wayne as Bammy Stone from the hotel. I got your reservation. Not that you needed it. We ain't been full up since Teddy Roosevelt passed through in 1911. <laughs> you know, you know, Mr. O'Neill, I couldn't help but notice you're from Missouri. Not only is Phoenix the, what, the fifth largest metropolitan city in America, I believe St. Louis is the 20th. Your hometown collects abandoned buildings, but when we appear in your comics, we're populated by a bloodhound, a mule, and the cast of Deliverance. So then some dudes roll through town on dune buggies, at which point uh, Batman just up and punches them out of their seat for, I mean, really no good reason. And then, worst of all, he calls attention to it in the thought bubbles by saying, oh, they're doing no real damage, but I'm still going to punch them in the head. <laughs> <laughs> when it finally uh, falls to fisticuffs between him and the douchebag son from All in the Family, you can't help but root against Bats. And I think the writer kind of is, too. Of course, Denny O'Neill being Denny O'Neill, the hippies were actually being used by the most nefarious villain of all, a resident of the Southwest, who uh, promptly volunteers his entire culpability from his hotel bed to Batman, really for no appreciable reason of any kind. Batman didn't have him dead to rights here. He had not figured the mystery out completely. He actually thought Lamont was laundering the cash. He sees some douche in spandex show up and he's like, all right, well, time to confess to the entirety of my evil plan, I suppose. Like, <laughs> if I'm making it sound bad, I apologize. It's, it's actually a killer little comic chiefly on the basis that it spotlights the two leads. Uh, Batman is his weird transitional early 70s self, and the Shadow is treated with relative reverence, though I do have a bone to pick, and always have, with how Denny O'Neill made himself culpable here in the most prominent case of plagiarism in the history of comics, that being Batman. Look, we know now what the deal was. We'll get into it a bit more when we get to Partners of Peril. But Batman was more than merely inspired by the Shadow, as O'Neill alleges here. Not only was his first entire story uh, a beat-by-beat -beat remake, essentially, of the Theodore Tinsley Shadow Pulp Partners of Peril, Bob Kane actually traced artwork from that very pulp and put it in the final comic. And it wasn't the last time that would happen either. Batman's Batwing or Batjet or whatever cannon crushing hacks over at DC are calling it these days. It was not only not originally a jet, it was a bat gyro, a virtual copy of the Shadow's auto gyro. Uh, batarangs were swiped in a story called Lingo that we'll talk about in a later podcast, I actually already recorded. And even the Joker resembles not only Death's Harlequin, one of the most famous shadow pulps ever published, but a backup story in The Whisperer magazine, who started in the pages of The Shadow, called The Grim Joker, whose artwork appears to have inspired Jerry Robinson's Joker card. The Whisperer's gimmick, by the way, you ask? He's a vigilante crime fighter who dual wields twin silenced automatics and when he nears an enemy begins to whisper his derision from the shadows and oh, oh that's right, he also happens to be named Police Commissioner James Gordon. <laughs> Complete coincidence, <laughs> I'm absolutely sure. Look, I like Denny O'Neill, but 
he's a company man. He was the Batman editor for how many freaking years? He helped cover up plagiarism on behalf of DC, and that's all there is to it. And this comic, as cool as it is to see a clash of caped crusaders, is a big reason why that BS persists to the present day, I think. Uh, because when Bats and the Shadow finally square off, wealthy young man about town, Bruce Wayne, says, uh, I've never told anyone this, but you're my biggest inspiration. <laughs> Something... Denny O'Neill had to know was Bull, even as he wrote the words. I mean, the original artist on the Shadow comics from DC, I think after Alex Toth, uh, the comic, by the way, that this is effectively an advertisement for, was supposedly to be written and illustrated by Jim Steranko, who has been fairly vocal over the decades about how obvious Batman being purloined from the pulp adventure in question actually is. There is no conceivable way Denny O'Neill wasn't aware, meaning he knew and wrote into the story a device to help cover it up. I dig some of Denny's later output, even if his affront to the question is one of the worst offenses Steve Ditko ever suffered, and that's saying something. But this crossover always kind of left a bad taste in my mouth for that reason, though it's still a good one-off comic. Though it's admittedly small potatoes compared to what Dynamite and DC did a little bit later, but that's another comic for another podcast. This concludes my report from the Shadowcast. As I said, several episodes are already in the can, so if you'll continue down this path to uncover the birth of a dark legend, then always remember... <laughs> Ha, 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 ha,